Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today's video is again going to be on a writing topic, but thinking about it in terms of not only what authors are doing, but we as readers, what we are reading, why we are reading and how it allows us to understand the text. And the concept I want to talk about is the concept of focalization. Now, my good friend and uh, erstwhile nemesis, Dr. Philip Chase, had asked me to sort of explain a bit more about focalization. And this has to do with how a narrative, how a narrator limits information. And it's a theory that was proposed by Gerard Jeanette, one of my favorite narratologists. Uh, he's, he's a great literary theorist and actually quite funny. But when we talk about point of view and we talk about narrator and narrative perspective, and there are all sorts of different ways of talking about it. And focalization was a way that Jeanette was trying to discuss a particular aspect of it. So this is not the only way to think about it. This is in addition to the other ways that we already know, this was a new way to try and conceive of what was going on. And I've taken an excerpt from the opening of Stormfront by Jim Butcher, one of the, the first Harry Dresden book, because it's, it's from the very, very opening. It's not going to spoil the book for anyone, because I want to run through this concept of focalization. And let's start with outlining what it is. So the first thing that Jeanette did was he created three different terms, zero focalization, external focalization, and internal focalization. And in essence, and again, this is an introduction to the concept, and I'm not going into huge amounts of depth about it, but zero focalization was a complete freedom of perspective and knowledge in the text, something that we generally associate with an omniscient narrator. The omniscient narrator knows what all the different characters in a scene know. The omniscient narrator knows what is going to happen in the scene before it happens. Um, and that's what zero focalization is, that the scene that we are reading is not focalized, is not focused through the perspective of any one person. There can still be a point of view character. So for instance, a Jon Snow chapter, but there can still be an omniscient narrator. And you can see why Jeanette was trying to articulate this, because quite often, if you think of A Song of Ice and Fire, there's a Jon Snow chapter. So who is the narrator of that? Well, Jon Snow. It's, it's from his perspective. You go, well, it's not. The narrator can be and is often distinct from the point of view character. So this was Jeanette's way of trying to articulate that distinction. So zero focalization is quite often on uh, the omniscient perspective, and it's the freedom of knowledge and perspective in the scene. External focalization is when the point of view in the scene is limited to what the character can perceive. So it's not what the character thinks, but just what the character can see, hear, smell, touch, and taste. It is limited to the character knowledge of what is going on, but it's the external perspective of it. It's not giving you the interiority of the character. And then we have internal focalization. And that's when there's a point of view character and the point of view of the scene is not only the external focalization, everything outside of that character, but also the interiority of that character. But another way of thinking about this, another way to articulate this point is that with zero focalization, the narrator reveals more of what is going on in the scene than the point of view character can possibly know. That the narrator has access to knowledge that the character does not have and is sharing that with the reader. With external focalization, the narrator reveals less than 
what the character knows. So the character may have an interpretation of events, the character may have backstory, may have history, may have all of this knowledge, but the narrator decides and chooses to only reveal what the character is perceiving, not what the character thinks about it. So in terms of knowledge, the narrator is revealing less than what the character actually knows. And then we have internal focalization. And that is very, very straightforward. The narrator reveals exactly what the character knows, that that is the, the point of view. The character and narrator have, have collapsed in that instance, even though the narrator is still a distinct entity. For all functional purposes, what the character sees and hears and perceives and what the character thinks about those things, that is what is revealed to the reader. So you can see that this ties into various aspects of, about omniscient narration as well as limited narration, and also what we think of in terms of first and third person perspective. This is another way of articulating aspects of that. So this is a section from the very beginning of uh, Stormfront by Jim Butcher, book one of the Dresden Files. And what I have done is I have altered and edited the text to change it into a, an externally focalized perspective. Now, I am not in any way saying that this is a better version. And I want to point out two things here. Number one, Jim Butcher is a professional author. Therefore, his text should be better than the text I am putting in front of you. I'm not a professional author. But number two, he wrote this from a particular perspective. Therefore, what is being constructed in the scene should be leaning into that and therefore using the different types of focalization. While this is an exercise to show you what that does, using the different types of focalization is not an attempt to to improve or or show any of those aspects of the text that what i'm doing here is taking something that was written with one type of focalization and changing it so that you can compare them so that you can understand what this thing this aspect of focalization is doing an illustration of it this is not about jim butcher's text so he finished up his paperback and tossed it into the done box. There was a pile of red and discarded paperbacks in a cardboard box on one side of his desk, the spines bent and pages mangled. He was idly eyeing the, the pile of unread books when his phone rang. He stared at it in a somewhat surly fashion. After the third ring, he picked it up. He picked up the receiver and said, Dresden? Oh, is this um Harry Dresden, the uh, wizard? Her tone was apologetic. So looking at this, you can see I have put lines through and made some changes. Firstly, it's external. So the first person narration has gone. This is now in third person. It's external to the character. Secondly, anything that was based on character knowledge and backstory that has actually been removed because with an external focalization, we, the narrator, is not revealing that information to us. So he was terribly hard on books. That is a comment about Harry's uh, habits, which when you're viewing that scene, you do not have access to that knowledge. So that has been removed. Um, considering what to start next. We don't know what his thoughts are. We can see him. Think of external focalization, almost like a, a film camera, that you can see the expression on Harry's face. You can see him looking at something. But what you cannot know is what he is thinking. It would have to be a supposition. And the narrator is not going to make that supposition for you. The narrator is going to show you what is happening in the text and ask you, to make up your own mind. So we don't have considering which to start next, given that he had no real work to do. Those are all aspects of information that we do not know. We can guess from the fact that there's a stack of books on his desk and there's a 
box full of red books next to his desk that he is wasting time. But we don't know that. We don't know that he had no real work to do. He stared at it in a somewhat surly fashion. And you go, yeah, we can see that his face is somewhat surly. But what we don't have is wizards are terrific at brooding. That is knowledge from inside Harry's head. After the third ring, and I deleted, when I thought I wouldn't sound a little too eager, because again, that is about Harry's intentions and Harry's thought process. And externally, we don't know that's what he's thinking. And then lastly, on the phone call, as though she were terribly afraid she would be insulting him. That is a supposition that Harry is making. It is an interpretation that Harry has of the information. And that is internal. We are looking at external only. So we get a report of what she said and the fact that her tone was apologetic. We can identify that from the sound of her voice, that it was apologetic. What we don't know is the intentionality. We don't know how Harry is interpreting it. And to illustrate this, obviously, this scene is written with internal focalization because it is written from Harry's perspective. So this is actually the original of the, the scene from Stormfront. I finished up my paperback and tossed it into the done box. There was a pile of red and discarded paperbacks in a cardboard box on one side of my desk. The spines bent and, and the pages mangled. I'm terribly hard on books. I was eyeing the pile of unread books, considering which to start next, given that I had no real work to do, when my phone rang. I stared at it in a somewhat surly fashion. We wizards are terrific at brooding. After the third ring, when I thought I wouldn't sound a little too eager, I picked up the receiver and said, Dresden? Oh, is this um Harry Dresden, the uh, wizard? Her tone was apologetic, as though she were terribly afraid she would be insulting me. And we can see we are, yes, it's first person, but we are directly behind Harry's eyes. We are living his experience, but we also have his knowledge. We have his interpretation of these things. So now we're getting his commentary on stuff because this is focalized through that internal perspective. We have access to his interiority. And now we have zero focalization. Harry finished up his paperback and tossed it into the done box. There was a pile of red and discarded paperbacks in a cardboard box on one side of his desk. The spines bent and the pages mangled. He was terribly hard on books. He was eyeing the pile of unread books, considering which to start next, as he had no real work to do. When his phone rang, he stared at it in a somewhat surly fashion. Wizards are terrific at brooding. After the third ring, when he thought he wouldn't sound too eager, he picked up the receiver and said, Dresden? Oh, is this um, Harry Dresden, the uh, wizard? Monica asked. Admittedly, not her real name. Her tone was apologetic. She was nervous and she was terribly afraid. Now, I, oh God, I have a typo in this. Now, you can see that this is basically the same thing. I've kept the zero focalization is the narrator has access not only to everything that Harry knows, but also access to everything in the um, in the story, in the narrative. The narrator knows everything that's going on. And so what I've done just to illustrate that, because zero focalization here is is allowing us to dip in and out of Harry's mind and anyone's mind. But if we look at that last section, her name Monica is given before Harry can know it, because the narrator knows who Monica is. Harry doesn't. When Harry picks up the phone, we saw that in the internal focalization. The caller is female and unnamed because Harry doesn't know her name. But here, because the narrator is omniscient, Monica's name is given. And not only that, the narrator then comments on it and says, admittedly, not her real name, telling the reader that, yes, this person is going to be called Monica, but that's not her name. And it is additional information that Harry is not aware of, that Monica has not revealed, that is not revealed in the text, but the narrator knows. So the narrator can choose to add in information that Harry is unaware of, 
because this is separate to Harry's experience. While Harry is the point of view character and we're experiencing the story as he moves along it, the narrator can give the reader at any point information from any other part of the narrative, any other part of Harry's backstory, because the narrator is omniscient and is not tied to Harry's perspective. Yes, the narration is following Harry, but it is not specifically tied to just what Harry can see or just what Harry thinks. So in those examples, you can see that with the zero focalization, there isn't supposition on the part of the narrator. The, the narrator knows these things and says that, yes, she was nervous. Yes, she was feeling these things. Yes, that is not her real name and that she's going to claim that her name is Monica. The narrator knows all of this information and is giving it to the reader. But now, again, Jim Butcher, professional author, AP not a professional author. This is putting in very obvious things so you can see what I'm talking about, not putting in things that I think are better or this is how it should have been done. I'm trying to illustrate the concept because you would look at that and go, why would you give away Monica's name then and also give away that it's not her real name? You wouldn't. It's a mystery that Dresden is trying to solve. You wouldn't give away a lot of this information early. But depending on the style of narrative, you might want to do that. Think of books by Jane Austen, where the narrator is very past remarkable, where the narrator makes comments about other people, where the narrator has judgments and evaluations about people and is actually quite, you know, snarky at times. And that is using an omniscient narrator who knows all of these things and is telling the story to you. So even though each chapter will be following a specific moment or event, the narrator can choose what the reader is going to see, what information is given to the reader. The information is not tied to who is in the scene. With an internal focalization, the narration would be tied to, much as it is in first person, what that person is experiencing and how they feel about it. And with external focalization, yes, you choose a point of view that you are going to follow, that you are tied to, and you are limited only to the external stimuli of that character. So you can see how these are related techniques to choice of perspective, to narrative style, to the style of narration, all of these things are different ways of articulating and highlighting different aspects of the writing. It's not that you go, oh, I'm just doing this one thing. These all relate and interrelate to each other. And understanding different ways of looking through it helps us as readers understand what is happening on the page. It also helps us isolate when something is well done and when something is not well done, because we understand what is happening. We understand when a perspective has been chosen and this sort of style of focalization has been chosen, and then suddenly it is broken and then it goes back. That, that will then stand out to us. We can then look to see why an author may have chosen to alter the narration at that point. What is that highlighting? And if it is merely a slip, that it's not actually adding something, that this is merely a slip, then we can isolate it as a mistake. But if it is suddenly highlighting something and drawing your attention to it and creating a very specific effect in us, then we can go, oh, that's why they broke the rule. It's understanding how these effects are created seeing these signals within a text. So the more techniques that we are aware of, the more of these different approaches to understanding what is on the page that we personally have, the better we can understand a text. But I hope that you have enjoyed this and it adds to this idea of how character can be used to alter narration. And narration is not just the character dialogue. It is also the exposition, be it um, action or description.
that focalization through a character can alter these things. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I'll see you in the next one.